Georgina, well done first and foremost. You got this story a couple of days before everyone else. So obviously you're not going to tell us how, but really good wheeze, really good intel. Yes, sure. Um, look, I think um, the the axe had been hovering over Eddie for a long time. Uh, and I think there was something different about it this time. And I uh, I think everyone could sense it. Um, I think certainly a week out, um, there was an acknowledgement in the English media that, you know, that this time the axe was really hovering. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd venture that Eddie probably sensed a difference to the tone as well. So um, I don't think it... Well, actually, it's interesting to look at the reaction because um, I think while um, many people, you know, it's easy to kind of throw out a comment on social media that he needs to go. Um, I think there are actually a lot of people, a lot of former players, a lot of pundits were surprised um, that that they did pull the trigger because, you know, they'd been a, they'd, we've kind of felt like we've, we've been in this place before with England and Eddie, but as I said, there was definitely a difference to it, uh, to the tone of it all. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting to see the reaction as well. Did the did the timeline um, come into this for you in the in the fact that he seems to have a cycle three or four years and then it all turns to custard. The first couple of years are great. I mean, he's a bit like Jose Mourinho. By the time the third or fourth year rolls around, it all just starts falling apart. I mean, did 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 did, did, did that occur to you as well? Um, I would probably flip that and ask you how many coaches you know who can have long term sustained success I mean I know it's the holy grail and every union talks about succession planning and kind of building a legacy and New Zealand were very good at it for a long period of time um, but I'd say they're the the outlier um, and then I'd put Warren Gatland I guess with Wales uh, in that in that category as well but I think they're definitely the outlier and you don't you don't see a lot of test coaches who can do two terms if you want to call them in terms of four year World Cup cycles and have success over that period. So um, probably I think Eddie look, I've seen it written and I and I know he said it he he, he said that he should have um, left the Australian Post. He stayed too long and um, and I think you know he definitely say he stayed too long this time as well. Um, yeah. Is it all about the World Cup? This, uh, you know, given the fact that uh, Wales have also ditched PVAC, that uh, you know, that you know, they're looking out. Heck, look, if we if we want to perform at this World Cup and we're not performing now, we've got to make a radical change straight away. I mean, don't forget also that New Zealand rugby was right on the brink of this this year as well with Ian Foster. Yes, that's that's right, Marty. I think um, I think oh, yeah, the World Cup is the holy grail. 100%. And, I, you know, the, the, the perennial argument um, is, is whether, you know, World Cups are the be-all and end-all or whether every test needs to be won. And the people who don't like coaches talking about cycles and World Cup cycles um, are the people who want every test to have meaning uh, and, and, and can't stomach uh, dips in between the cycles or, you know, um, prolonged dips, uh, which I un I do understand it, but I, I I think it's very hard to have both. And I think Eddie Jones's first period with, um, with England was the perfect example of, of, of the cycle working as it should. And I, I think probably what every test coach is striving for, um, you know, he had a dip, uh, he had... I think it was really successful 2016, his first year in charge, less successful 2017. 2018, he was on the brink of getting the sack. Um, but one test in South Africa saved saved his neck and, and then they went on the up from there. That was the turning point, which culminated in that um, All Blacks semi-final win. Um, so, uh, but then when it happened again, I think what, what was different was um, I think there's a disconnection with the playing group. Um, and some observers have made the point that Steve Borthwick, the Leicester Tigers coach, you know, who was Eddie's forwards coach at the 2019 World Cup um, and was mentored by Eddie, that he was really sort of the, the, the man manager 
in there. And without him, Eddie's really struggled to replace that figure and doesn't have the warmth and probably emotionally, emotional intelligence um, to fill that gap himself. So um, I think New Zealand, you know, is definitely, again, the, the Graham Henry, Steve Hansen era. I, I don't like when have we ever seen any other nation do that apart from Wales under Warren Gatland. I think they are unique and definitely the exception to the rule. It is exceptionally hard to create and then sustain success at test level. You don't get players for long periods of time. Uh, and, and the difference now in this last couple of years is that there is nothing between the top six teams in the world. Um, so the world, I think the World Cup, um, you know, is the be-all and end-all. And, um, and to expect sort of 70% win rates uh, in between then, in between those, those posts, I think is probably not, you know, it's really tough. That's a really tough KPI these days. Georgina Robinson, Chief Rugby Reporter for the Sydney Morning Herald. You've also written that Scott Robertson, uh, this is not in for the England job. So, I mean, so again, this has raised a lot of questions here in New Zealand as to exactly what's going to happen with him. Um, we do know, uh, you know, of course, that New Zealand rugby are very keen to keep him. I mean, they've said that without saying it. But you also sort of allude that Australia might be in the mix here too. Is that really realistic? I mean, if you're sitting there, Scott Robertson, I mean, he wants the all-black job. He said he'd have the England job. I mean, that seems to be second. Why on earth would you want a Wallabies job? Oh, why would you want a Wallabies job? I'll give you a few reasons. Okay. There's a 2025 British and Irish Lions tour inbound. Uh, Then there's a 2027 Home World Cup. Uh, And before that, you've actually um, got a group of players Um, that have been, I think, certainly vastly improved by four years of Dave Rennie. Uh, And um, I also think that the profile of the Wallabies and the Australian players um, would suit Scott Robertson. I don't think the profile of the England players would suit him as well. Now, I'm not saying he couldn't coach them and couldn't coach them well. He's clearly an exceptional coach. Um, but I think I think if you're Scott Robertson, certainly the All Blacks are the players you want to coach. Um, and I guess I'm just we're, we're good opportunists here. So the point I was making in the story is if he misses the England job, and then he gets pipped at the post again um, for the All Blacks job, there's an opportunity for Australia, which has happened before. It happened in 2007 when mm. Robbie Dean missed out on the All Blacks job and Australia cannily jumped on him uh, and, you know, and the rest is history there. Um, I think, you know, there's also, I'll give you another factor on why the Wallabies job is, is a job you'd actually want. It's, it pays well. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's um, probably somewhere in the top five for, for test, for test jobs in terms of remuneration. So, you know, they'll, they'll, They'll fork out for the right person. Um, and I, look, I'm not saying he is going to miss out on the um, on the England job. He was, I think, for quite a stretch, um, considered their preferred candidate. That was certainly what I was hearing from a, from a couple of different sources. Um, but there was some some pressure to go with an Englishman. And um, and since since that those guys interviewed in November, that's Ronan O'Gara. Steve Borthwick and Scott Robertson. Um, I think Borthwick has firmed as as the front runner, uh, and um, and certainly everything I'm hearing and also reading is that he will be named. Is that replacement. Georgina? Is that through to the World Cup, post the World Cup? Uh, because uh, you know, I don't know. Right, because I mean, again with Robertson, you just know. wonder if you're going to take the England job, you'd want it after the World Cup as well. You'd have to say, give me another four years, wouldn't you? Well, I think you'd be very careful in what you signed up for in the first place. So you, you wouldn't, you know, it's a, it's a buyer's market, frankly, um, that job. I mean, you, as, as a national union, even though you're England, um, you can't, you, and if you want the best, you have to have a degree of flexibility in the contracting term. So I don't think you can say, listen, let's just, uh, just take it for nine months and then yeah. we'll see how it goes. Um, that's a huge risk for a coach so I think there definitely need to be some flexibility there um, but um, what I really loved over the past 48 hours is Warren Gatlin's comment just putting it right back on New Zealand rugby saying 
you've got to give this guy, meaning Scott Robertson, an opportunity. Um, the pressure's on them to make to make the right decision. And I think if, whichever way they go, one, they're going to end up with a bloody fantastic coach, whether it's a Jamie Joseph or a Scott Robertson. Um, and, you know, apologies to Ian Foster for, I guess, assuming that he probably won't um, won't take them beyond the World Cup, but doesn't look like um, he'd be the preferred option. Um, but two, you're also... Um, going to end up really upsetting some portion of your of your fan base because there is clearly a fan hunger for Razor to get a go um, but you know I think there's also um, Jamie Joseph is an exceptional candidate and the only one with with some test experience actually no, look so perceptive yeah so perceptive of you I mean, when I when I read that I just thought you know that no one else has brought this up yet that uh, Joseph Tony Brown were the running uh, the, the the first choice running mates for Ian Foster um, when when all the big cock up happened after the Tokyo World Cup and you know they, 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 they were going to be it but of course they fannied around so much and in the end you know Jamie took a job with Japan they paid him five times more and this is what New Zealand rugby is faced with again they got this conundrum happen, happening again I mean what a terrible catch twenty two to be in for them because look if they don't appoint Razor. Um, well, then there's a good chance he goes. If they don't secure uh, Jamie Joseph, well, he'll do the same again. And then you've got Ian Foster sitting there. And what say he does win the World Cup? And what say he does and he wants to continue after that? <laughs> you know, I, don't, I wouldn't like to be in oh, their position. It's, it's a, no, it's, it's a really tough one. Look, I mean, you've got an embarrassment of talent uh, in your playing stocks and an embarrassment of talent in your coaching stocks. So, uh, you know, there, there is a limit to my sympathy for the New Zealand rugby predicament, <laughs> <laughs> Marty. But, um, yeah. No, but, but you're completely right. And I think the other interesting factor, two, two interesting factors, um, they've indicated they want to go early on it, uh, which um, will probably, I can only guess, is terribly destabilising for Ian Foster. Uh, New Zealand rugby's always waited until after the World Cup. But, but this time they've indicated, and time will tell whether they stick to that or change their mind, they've indicated that they want to sew something up early because Razor and Joseph... Um, you know, are busy men with lots of opportunities. So um, that's that's going to be interesting if you if you decide to uh, to to go through a process and you don't appoint or reappoint your current coach. What that does to a squad in the lead up to a World Cup. That's interesting. Um, and I've forgotten the other interesting thing. Oh no, the other interesting factor is the Joe Schmidt factor. You've got um, one of the world's most revered coaches already in your system and you've committed to him uh he doesn't he doesn't want a head coach in kind of public facing role but he's 100 percent. i think i've heard it or seen it written he's been dubbed the kingmaker and that sounds about accurate to me uh you've got to make sure that the pe- that the person you bring in as the new coach um is a good fit with joe schmidt uh, so, and I don't know enough about New Zealand rugby politics or any of the any of the players, um, meaning the coaches' histories, to know who is and who isn't a good fit. But that's the other interesting factor. Finally, uh, quickly, and thank you again so much for your time. You've been so generous with it. Um, Dave Rennie, is he the Wallabies coach at next year's World Cup or not? From from what I hear, he certainly is. I I don't sense an appetite. Um, to let him go. Before Eddie Jones was sacked by England, uh, I don't think Australia had many options. If they wanted to um, do an England and a Wales and sack their coach nine months before a World Cup, I think the most likely scenario if they had was a, was Dan McKellar, the current sort of senior assistant coach and Brumbies, former Brumbies coach, acting stepping up and taking them through in a kind of a caretaker mode. Um, but I don't think they're going to do that, uh, barring some kind of uh, late sentiment change. But they will have to make a decision uh, with no other evidence than the evidence they've already got from this year. They've, they've played all the rugby. They've got the injury list. Um, they've seen the, the good parts of Dave's, of Dave's development of the team and they've seen, you know, the gaps. So they're going to need to make a decision because Dave has said that um, he wanted to know early in the year because if he if he is without a job at the end of 2023, he needs to be able to 
um, commit to something else with enough time. So I think, you know, both parties have kind of, Dave really has sort of forced the issue and um, at a 38% win rate, it is, it will be hard for Rugby Australia to ask its supporter base to support extending a coach, no matter what his nationality or his personality um, on a 38% win rate.